we made all kinds of interpretations and one of the interpretation that stands valid is if you say 14 years up to the age of 14 years it means that 8 years of education because children start their schooling after completing 5 years so 6 to 14 becomes 8 years and that's also the age that's also the duration of basic education provided in many other countries that's the basic understanding that we have so the constitution really requires provision of this elementary education of 8 years to every child this was well recognized in 1950 itself, but there were quite a few problems. What is being interpreted? Or we have, after the constitution has made in 1950, immediately we have taken up the program of universalization of elementary education. That is, elementary education should be universal, should be provided to every child of 6 to 14 years group, free and compulsorily. So, it essentially includes three important uh, strategies. One is to enroll every child into the school system. Every child of this, uh, this age group must be in the schools. That's the basic minimum thing, universal enrollment of the, of the children. Second is, every child, since we wanted eight years of education, every child must be retained in the school system until they complete eight years of schooling at least, minimum. So, it should be retention should be there. And obviously, when they are in the schools, we expect to learn something, attain certain specific characteristic features, attain certain levels of knowledge in terms of three arts, three arts reading, writing, and arithmetic. So there should be some minimum levels of learning, attainment of those things. So universalization of elementary education essentially is defined for operational purposes into these three major components. But unfortunately, we have been confined to the very first goal because that's, that's important, but that itself became a huge task. And the attention paid to the second and the third was much less, relatively much less, uh, if not nil. Now, yeah, I, I don't have to spend much time on this. You know the whole educational system, and this is, this is the base that we have. Today, something like 14 crores of children are there in the primary schools. Primary school is classes one to five and the upper primary is 6 to 8, and the 8 years is the elementary education that we are defining. So, uh, we have nearly 20 crores of children in our primary and upper primary schools or elementary education system that we are mainly concerned about uh, today in the discussion. <coughs> now, <coughs> yeah, this is the same thing. This, this is defined as primary education as defined as age group 6 to 14 as groups, and upper primary as 11 to 14, this is 6 to 14 in all. <coughs> Oh, oh, sorry, where did I go? Did I go back? Okay. Uh, as I said, I'll give you a few statistics, not very many statistics, but some statistics about what we are talking about. The system is really very huge. We are concentrating only on primary and upper primary education or elementary education. Today we have something like a lack of schools, more, more than one lakh schools in the whole, whole country, uh, primary and upper primary, uh, with, as said, nearly 20 crores of children. Uh, in again primary and upper primary etc. The last one is the enrollment ratios and where I will spend a little bit more time on the enrollment ratios. Uh, the primary enrollment ratio has crossed from something like 42 percent, uh, started from 42 percent in 1950-51 and crossed about 100 percent in the recent years. The upper primary enrollment ratio has increased from 32 to 90 percent, 96 percent or so. No, not 92, 71 percent. And if you put them together, the, the total enrollment ratio in the elementary education is around 95 percent. These are enrollment ratios and these are also gross enrollment ratios. In the sense that out of the age group, the defined age group of 6 to 14, how many children are going? We find the official estimates say that there are 96 percent, 96 children for every 100 are in the elementary schools. Since they are gross, there are problems uh, with respect to the data collection. It could be more than 100 also. Particularly, children who are over age group or under age group are also considered in calculating the under gross enrollment ratio. So it's quite possible that it's more than 100. Or in the level, at some, in some states, or in certain particular groups of, groups of population. But the actual enrollment ratio, or the net or refined estimate of enrollment ratio would be less than 100%. Uh, in any system. Now, if you 
look at this whole provision of elementary education, as I said, we had defined these three parameters and largely concentrated on three four aspects. How to provide universal access to education in terms of providing schools of every, skills everywhere, providing quality education to everywhere. It's not just elementary education, but quality, quality, universal quality elementary education to every child, which should be, of course, equitable. We also have one particular characteristic feature, which is an important strength of the education systems everywhere, if it is there, and there's a diversity. Diversity in terms of different kinds of schools, so catering to different groups of population, or preferably different groups of population in the same schools uh, is an important characteristic feature. In our planning policy framework, we have like a very specific norm of providing schools everywhere. For every, every habitation of 300 population, its primary school must be there, which was revised to 200 later, so that even smaller habitations will have a school. And similar ratios or similar norms are also there for upper primary schools, so that both primary and upper primary schools are available to everybody. There are very, very specific norms, some of which are being revised and re-revised nowadays on what should be constituting a primary school or an upper primary school in terms of teachers, in terms of head teachers, in terms of pupil-teacher ratios, how many, how many teachers should be there for every group of students and what should be the physical infrastructure facilities in every school. <coughs> I'll refer to some of them later. And they are becoming contentious issues nowadays. The, not only providing access, I think it's an equitable access that is being, we are really concerned about it. And uh, from the very beginning, when we are saying equitable access, one of the most important easy strategies is to provide it free. So it's a free education for all, uh, including the further rich people. In fact, there is no justification because of the characteristic features that we discussed. Everybody should be having free education, compulsorily. <coughs> There are also additional incentives for those economically weaker sections <coughs> or socially backward sections to come to the schools in terms of scholarships, in terms of other, uh, some of which are universal like known meals are to be provided to all children, uniforms, textbooks are to be provided necessarily to all the children. Uh, but there are scholarships which are not necessarily provided to all the children. <coughs> there are also programs which are working with respect to provision of schooling, schooling facilities specifically for backward sections of the society, etc. The third important parameter is the quality, and with respect to quality, we largely concentrated on quality in terms of inputs. That is easily operational in a, in a planning framework. So how many teachers have to be provided? We have defined teacher training as important consideration for providing, for appointing teachers. We have defined teacher people ratios. We have defined that every teacher should have should be provided with material, textbooks and learning and teaching material apart from aid, etc. So we have very clear norms of providing, even though we concentrated largely on the pupil-teacher ratio, the last one that was referred to it. So we have reasonably good parameters of providing access to education, equity in education, and quality in education. And quality includes, of course, provision of material to the students also, apart from uniforms, but also providing textbooks and uh, other material. I said the, the fourth important feature of the education system that we have is uh, diversity of different kinds and we have different kinds of schools, central schools to local body schools apart from primary schools and special schools. We have also diversity in terms of medium of media of instruction, we have also diversity in terms of schools for tribal children, schools, ashram salas or uh, residential schools and different kinds of uh, schools that we have. Let me not go further into these aspects. Let me now refer to some of the major problems that we face and then go into the policy issues very, very quickly in another 20 minutes or so. Uh, one of the most important problems is, you remember I said every child who enrolls in, the, in grade one must be retained in the school system until he completes eight years of schooling five years of schooling for primary education and eight years of schooling for elementary education. But a large number of children drop out before completing primary cycle and before completing secondary cycle. Sorry. So today, even though there is a significant, very significant improvement over the years, at least 25% of the children who, grade, who 
or enrolled in grade 1 do not complete grade 5. And nearly 50% of the children drop out before completing grade 8, which is a constitutional directive that we have, which again came down very recently to 46-47%. But a substantial number drops out in the sense that children who should be in the schools, sorry, children who should be in the schools are out of school system. As a result, today we have a large number of children who are outside the school. And that number is a very sizable number. There are different kinds of estimates because we don't have really very, very fine methodology of estimations. We have to base upon the household surveys, we have to base upon the enrollment statistics, which have, the, which have their own weaknesses, <laughs> official statistics. And the estimates range between 1 crore to nearly 4 crores of children. The government claims that there has been a very significant improvement in the recent years. There is significant improvement, but we do not know whether it is less than 1 crore. The government says it is now much less than 1 crore. But some estimates say that yes, we have nearly 4 crores, if not above 4 crores of children, who should be in the school of the age group 6 to 14, but they are not in the school. <coughs> Let me not go into the... The second important problem that we have is, of course, the inequalities. <laughs> this is one that has to be provided universally without any discrimination by gender, by caste, by economic categories, by regional groups, etc., by regional characteristic features. But we find almost all kinds of inequalities in the education, in the elementary education system. And I refer to some inequalities, particularly by gender. And also, I think rural urban. Rural is, in fact, the whole education problem is with respect to rural education, or urban, urban concentration is much smaller. So we have regional inequalities, we have inequalities between girls and boys, and inequalities between different social groups of population. Whatever may be the indicator you look at it, whether the enrollment ratios, or whether you look at dropout rates, or completion rates, or some limited data that we have with respect to the attainment levels, levels of learning with, different, with respect to different subjects. If you look at the girls versus boys, the gender parity index, how many girls are there for every 100 boys? There again, we find a significant improvement over the years, that for every 100 children, there are 94, there are every 90, for every 100 boys in primary school, there are 94 girls now. But earlier, 40 to 50 year children used to be there. So there is a very significant level of improvement with respect to primary education and some improvement with respect to upper primary education. And much of the improvement, if you look at it, has taken place during the last 15, 20 years. Particularly after 1991, in fact, I didn't give a figure here. I can say that from 1986 onwards, because 1986 was a period where a second national policy on education was formulated and quite a few important initiatives were initiated. So we have quite a significant improvement in between 86 and now compared to the improvements between 51 and 86 with respect to every indicator. Now this also shows this particular index that uh, as far as gender inequalities are concerned, there is satisfactory progress or reasonably good progress in the sense that for almost every 100 child, there are 100 boys, there are 90 girls in the primary schools. These are gross enrollment ratios again. We find a big difference, I mean, we find slightly more bigger difference with respect to upper primary education compared to primary education. In fact, I have used this for developing further. If you go by different levels of education, the inequalities between boys and girls is the least in primary education, but goes very high as we go to the higher levels of education. Even between primary and upper primary, we find some differences, though not so stock uh, differences. The, when the, we are concerned with respect to quality of education, as we said, as I, as I said, one of the most important concerns is once one of the most important parameters is uh, people-teacher ratios, imports quality imports in terms of teachers. In the 1950s, there is an enrollment there in the sense that there was a teacher for every 20 students on average in primary schools. And compared to that situation, today we have a teacher for every 45 children. So in a sense, the increase in this ratio really means deterioration in the quality of facilities provided in quality of education as a whole. You find a similar thing with respect to upper primary education. There were less than 20 children for every primary school team, for every, in every, there were less than 20 children in upper primary schools for every teacher. 
which also increased to nearly 50 at one point of time and came down in the recent years. Uh, today again we are quarreling whether we should have these ratios of 45, 35 or we can have a higher ratios because we don't have really qualified teachers or uh, teachers salaries are becoming big etc. An issue that I will briefly refer to it later. Because of these problems like teacher shortages, shortage of trained teachers and teacher salary bills etc. We, can, we follow different kinds of policies in the recent years. And one of the most important ones that has been taken up is something like para teachers. As many of you know, a phenomenon that started with one particular state has been taken up almost like a national program of recruiting para teachers. Para teachers are by definition under qualified teachers, under trained teachers and also severely under paid teachers or contractual teachers. <laughs> Saying that we don't have sufficient teachers and we also don't have sufficient teachers to go to the rural areas, to go to the interior areas, to go to the tribal areas. Uh, because once you are a regular teacher, you try for a transfer to come to an urban area. So you have a para teacher who is a local youth who is not necessarily well educated and stationed in that particular village living there. So there are certain advantages, but there are also certain problems. And we have a large number of para teachers now. We didn't have para teachers at all in 1980s. Similarly, now there is a scheme called Education Guarantee Scheme System, which was introduced in Madhya Pradesh. Again, later it was taken up as a national program. This is almost like para teachers. It is a, an extension of the para teacher system to the para school system. That you don't have to have really a full formal school with so many classrooms, so many teachers, so much furniture, and so many inputs that we, are def we ourselves are defined. You can have an impoverished educational system and uh, say that yes, we will be able to meet the demand of increasing number of students, mm -hmm. and that's the education guarantee schools. I mean, one quick estimate is something like for a, for a formal primary school, the estimate is something like 40,000 rupees a year. The, a, an EGS school will cost 8,000 rupees to 10,000 rupees. So there is a huge money saving. Particularly after the economic problems became severe in 1990s, this was taken up as a very important measure of setting up of cheap schools and providing uh, education facilities. Because of this and also many other factors, we find really very low levels of achievement, the third important uh, component of universalization of elementary education. There are certain studies which have very recently shown and found that students who are in grade 4 and grade 5 are not able to read what was expected to be read by a student of grade 2 and what was not able to make a simple calculation what was to be done by a grade 2 student. These tests were not very common. In fact, we used to have a much better rigorous system, but for various policies of expansion, they were done away with. And uh, only now again, during the last 5 to 10 years, such attainment level tests or achievement level tests are being conducted, which show a very, very poor levels of achievement of these children. And again, there are, of course, very wide differences between different groups. Along with this, perhaps one of the, one of the whole source of problems is, of course, underfunding of the whole education system, including elementary education very specifically. Let me go into some more policy issues that we are talking about. <clears throat> well, I have referred to already the 86th Amendment to the Constitution in 2002, when the education was made a fundamental right, which really makes a sea change if we follow it up very seriously. We didn't follow it up. As I said, that I'll come back to it. A second major initiative that was done in, 90, in, two, in the present century, 2002, it was introduced, is a major program called Sarvasit Shabhiyan, literally meaning education for all. There is a global program of education for all, global international program, and we have a national program of uh, Sarvasit Shabhiyan and education for all. There are quite a few other programs and policies which I will briefly refer to, including the midday meal program that was now a universal program in the country as a whole, uh, and the central government funds that particular program. The 86th Amendment is important because, as I said, it really guarantees education as a fundamental right, 
and it will be provided free and compulsory to all children. I think I can skip some details. Uh, yeah, it's a fundamental right. It's a justiciable right in the sense that people can demand. People can go to the court and say that there is no school here. And it's my fundamental right. Then the school has to be provided. So government is really worried that we, everybody will go to the courts and demand quality schools and will not have sufficient funds to do, do that. And that's the hesitation the government is now failing to have this education right, right to education bill, which is to accompany this amendment. <coughs> And what is its guaranteed is very clearly is provide free education, which was guaranteed in the 1950 constitution but was not actually practiced because children are required to pay different kinds of fees in addition to tuition fees and incur different kinds of expenditure. I have, I have small information to give it to you. It's also expected to be really compulsory on the part of the parents and on the part of the government to provide it. And it's very clearly defined. Now this let me quickly, <coughs> quickly run through. Yeah. The Sarvasiksha Abhiyan program is an Indian program with quite a few important characteristic features, very clearly defined goals of making a convergent plan, converging all schemes and all policies with respect to elementary education into one basket of policies. And that is found to be administratively very, very convenient. And it's also a holistic program. An important feature of this particular activity is a funding mechanism is clearly spelled out. In the sense that perhaps there is nowhere else we have a very clear definition of who should finance elementary education. The central government or state government has to finance. Uh, and what is it? Oh, okay, I, 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 have, I have that, I'll come back to it. Yes, this very clearly says, but it's the same thing that, was, that is what is meant. And uh, the present goal is to do by 2010, but it could be deferred later. Yeah, with respect to financing, it very clearly says that center should finance a large part of it. And when the program was begun, 85% of the total funds for elementary education under Sarva Siksha Abhiyan was to come from the central government and 15% from the state governments. With a very clear understanding that that will come down gradually uh, to almost, not almost, to 50-50 levels by the end of the 11th five year plan. From the beginning of the 11th five year plan, but for practical reasons from the 11th fire plan end, it was now being planned that it will come to 50-50 levels. Presently it is around 65-35. Uh, that was also a negotiated one. There is an additional advantage of the Sarvasik Shabhyan scheme in the sense that the funds are not to lapse contrary to the general budgetary system at the central level. If you don't use the resources at the central level, the funds will not lapse uh, by the budget year or by even by the plan even by the plan period. Let me, yeah. There are quite a few important initiatives that was done with respect to girls' education. There is a national program of uh, improving girls' education. There is a special scheme of starting new schools uh, called Kasturi Bhagandhi Vidyalayas. And uh, this program, this uh, policy of recruiting more and more female teachers uh, with respect to primary and upper primary education specifically has been one of the important ones that has been very carefully monitored. Today, perhaps we have more teachers uh, or a larger number of female teachers than even male teachers in some states, but the ratio is increasing very rapidly over the years. At one point of time, it was decided that almost all new teachers will be only female teachers, but that was found to be practically difficult and later that was given up, but still the preference is to appoint more and more teachers from the other gender, essentially because they are fairer to the children, not only fair otherwise, but fairer to the children and children would be able to learn better if there is a female teacher at the lower levels of education. And there is large scale international evidence also to, to say that. Another important measure that was taken up, policy measure that was taken up is a large scale decentralization of the whole educational system. Uh, we have the constitutional provision of concurrency which says that center and the states have responsibilities of elementary education. And states can make their own policies, and they can make their own policies. As long as it do not conflict, it's fine.